Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Ian Kavat. In this undated photograph taken in New York, we can see two Chinese nationals in a restaurant. On the left is Gina Zhou and in the center is Carrie Yan. Both pleaded guilty in a U.S. court little more than a year ago to bribery and money laundering and were indicted. But what makes this story remarkable is what they intended to do. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean lies Taiwan diplomatic ally, the Marshall Islands, made up of more than 1,000 individual islands and islets. On one of these, Rongelap Atoll, the abandoned atoll, the pair wanted to establish a special autonomous zone, like Hong Kong, with courts, immigration and taxation. First proposed in 2017, it would be an autonomous mini-state within the state of U.S. ally, the Marshall Islands, home to an American military base that tests intercontinental ballistic missiles and tracks foreign rocket launches. To discuss this and why China seeks to influence the Marshall Islands, I'm joined by Lai Yizong, Prospect Foundation President, and Tsai Rongxiang, National Zhongzheng University Professor of Political Science. A very warm welcome to the show, both of you. Firstly, let's take a look at the strategic location of the Marshall Islands. We can see here the U.S.'s three island chains situated between Asia and the Americas and part of or in between the second and third island chains are the nations of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands and Nauru and Tuvalu, recognized by Taiwan are Palau, Marshall Islands and Tuvalu, recognized by China are the Federated States of Micronesia and from January this year, Nauru. For more, we're going to listen to Cleo Pascal. She begins by referring to the compact states of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. They are what's between you know, Hawaii and Guam and Philippines, as mentioned. So they, the, they provide this corridor of freedom of deployment for the U.S. that is unlike anything else. So you can just go right across the region, have whatever supplies you want, do whatever you want, and they're actually what makes the first and second island chain construct pro possible. So we think, we talk a lot about the first and the second island chain and how important they are, but, the, but if you can't resupply them, they're, they're nothing, right? If you can't get there, and what makes it possible to get there is uh, the voluntary allowing of U.S. deployment in the compact states. President Lai, come to you first. Can you explain how the island chains work? Yeah, when we talk about the Pacific, there are three island chains, first, second, and the third. And the first island chain, just the, uh, the islands and all together, uh, they are just right outside the Asian continent such, uh, for countries such as China. Mm -hmm. And basically, those island chains, they, uh, they play as a, a, um, as a tool that uh, should they uh, and, and has animosity toward the continental power such as China, then it could uh, contain China about mm -hmm. uh, its way over the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Professor Tsai, how would these island chains uh, work uh, in any possible Taiwan contingency? Okay, I want to mention the Guam Island because mm -hmm. as we know, it is very, very important uh, for the United States to deter uh, a potential Taiwan contingency mm -hmm. uh, from China's invasion because Guam is U.S. territory mm -hmm. and U.S. doesn't have to get involved with domestic politics uh, of a foreign, Guam, a foreign country if they try to use uh, Guam's basis. Mm. So the thing is that Guam is a logistics hub. Mm. And, uh, uh, for the US. For the US, yeah. and a jumping off point in the second island chain. Mm. If so China so each, each one basically has an anchor state, is that correct? Yes. Each of the island chains for the yeah. US. And the thing is that if China launch a military strike on Taiwan, mm. it would be little effect on Guam's operational ability because Guam is a little bit far away. Mm. So Guam can, uh, can be a backup for the Taiwan contingency. Mm. And those three co-far states, they are the backups for the Guam. Mm. So they are so important. So if the co-far states fall into China's hand, Guam, the American territory would be at risk. Mm. That's the, the, the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. And, th and the reason, um, why is it that they're able to be backup states is because the U.S. has that control over the over the territory, sort of like the, the yeah. U.S. military. Yes, U.S. has, mm. uh, especially in the Marshall Islands, U.S. had at least 20 military bases. Right. And for Micronesia, uh, 13 
mm. and there's one radar base uh, in Palau. Mm. So it's so strategically important for US. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're not gonna let, uh, leave those countries high and dry because mm. it's so important. And uh, the territory is much bigger than, than the American continent. Mm. Can you imagine that? It's, yeah. it's, it's so much bigger. Right. So on February 13th, Marshall Island President Hilda Heine wrote to an unnamed U.S. senator to ask that they do all they can to see that funding under the Compact of Free Association for her country, Palau, and the Federated States of Micronesia are ratified by Congress. The letter states, our nations give the U.S. strategic control of an expanse of the sea and air larger than the 48 contiguous states, including shipping lanes, the PRC covets, effectively extending the U.S. border for military purposes from Hawaii to Asia. A U.S. military expert testified that it would cost 100 billion U.S. dollars to replace this. Now, uh, if I can come to you, President Lai, uh, what does that mean, uh, extending the, the U.S. border all the way to Hawaii? What does uh, President Heidi mean by that? I think the, uh, uh, the COFA itself uh, typify a, a very special relation between the United States and the three countries, uh, three COFA countries. About the three countries, uh, none of them, they have their own military. Uh, so basically their f defense and foreign policy, especially defense, is uh, garnered by the United States. And U.S. can have a free passage in military operations uh, through those islands. Uh, those island nations, so that uh, this uh, special relationship is not going to be enjoyed by other countries, only for the United States. And that's why that uh, the, uh, the COVA itself is so important uh, strategically for the United States, especially for the U.S., from Hawaii all the way to the um, uh, Asian continent. Mm. Uh, th it's a big uh, spot of water, mm. and uh, through those water, the uh, support from those island states are very important. Mm. And the COFA just provide the United States with that tool. Mm. We uh, just heard from President Lai about uh, how strategic the COFA is. Uh, and this is why President Heine was writing to the US Senator, trying to say that by delaying the funding, that this is actually a threat to what the US itself needs to achieve, its, its facilities. Uh, also though, what does the Marshall Islands and the other two countries, what do they get in return for giving the U.S. access to, to their territory. Yeah, because uh, it's very important for those uh, states because the climate change uh, affects them seriously. Okay, so it's a death uh, life problem mm -hmm. for those three countries because uh, maybe a couple of years later, you know, they, those countries are not gonna uh, be inhabitable. Mm. Okay, maybe uh, the thing because is that- Because they'll be underwater. Underwater, mm. because the rising of sea levels. So uh, they have to be desperate. Mm. So right now, the US Congress is trying to help the, these three countries, mm. okay? Before, it was, it was a rider in the air to Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, and Israel, mm. right? But they try to uh, get detached from that kind of spending. Now they are trying to uh, pass a compromise beer to support for these, these three countries. Mm, yeah. Okay. Now, to understand what the COVA funds of 7.1 billion US dollars over 20 years to the three countries means in economic terms, let's take a look at a median amount for each country based on 40 million US dollars per year. Now, actual amounts vary for each country. Um, let's take this amount, 40 million, as a proportion of their GDP. Let's show up uh, the CG again, which shows us the proportion of that money to the GDP. I mean, that's 46% of their GDP. And the thing is that failure to pass this kind of funds open the door to more uh, corrupting influence and funding by PRC. The thing is that uh, it's, it's a life-saving uh, budget. So especially for Marshall Islands or, or the other countries, or the other two countries, uh, climate uh, resilience uh, is, very, is their first priority because uh, it has been losing uh, lands and its people. So according to some estimation, as soon as 2030, sea level rise can make Marshall Island you know, disappear. Okay? So the thing is that uh, currently, one third of Marshall needs pe uh, population uh, 
have migrated to the United States for safer and better uh, life. So the thing is that it's a very, very uh, serious problem, especially for these three countries. Mm. So this is, uh, they cannot wait, mm. okay? They cannot wait. Mm. Maybe they can use some you know, temporary funds or maybe they have some continuing resolution from the United States, but still it's not enough because they need to get it right now. Mm. Okay, let's return to the scheme hatched by the Chinese couple Carrie Yan and Gina Zhou to establish a special autonomous zone within the Marshall Islands. To find out more, I spoke to Cleo Pascal, a senior non-resident fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies who researches the Indo-Pacific and specializes in India and the Pacific Islands. Take a look. So this was, these were two uh, Chinese nationals who somehow managed to secure Marshallese citizenship and then uh, identified an atoll, Rongelap Atoll, which had had very uh, difficult time developing economically and told the local leaders that if you allow us to have uh, kind of a country within a country where we control things like immigration and taxation and customs, then we'll make you rich. And uh, they brought local leaders, but also national level leaders, including a former president, of the Marshall Islands to Hong Kong and tried to say, look, we're gonna create a Hong Kong. We're gonna create this. Uh, Hong Kong is the model for what we want to create in Rongelap Atoll. And they uh, liberally bribed enough members of the Nidigella, which is their the, the parliament, that they came within one vote of being able to get this legislation to pass through. And it had a very serious effect on the government of the then president, uh, Heine, who has since just been reelected, but she lost the subsequent election. President Heine was v voted back in as as president of Marshall Islands. What do you think that says um, about the feelings towards China, the U.S., and Taiwan? It's a very complex political system. So the vote for President Heine um, wasn't a direct vote. She was voted in by her members of parliament. But you certainly do have somebody now who is in power, who uh, has been personally targeted by a Chinese influence operation. And in her letter to uh, U.S. Congress recently, she says that, specifically talks about this influence operation and how it affected her previous government in her request for a uh, speedy resolution of the compacts of free association and saying that delays in the resolution can affect um, the efficacy of more PRC political warfare operations on the ground in the Marshall Islands. So let's go now to President Heine's letter. So in the letter, she writes, there have been carrot and stick efforts from the PRC to shift our alliances, including discontinuing support of Taiwan, a proposal to develop, develop one of our atoll municipalities if it were granted autonomy from our national government that I opposed, generated an effort to topple my government in our parliament. Later, people from the PRC were convicted by a US court of bribing proposal supporters in our parliament who voted against me. President Lai, tell me, what would setting up a Chinese-controlled Hong Kong, one country, two systems, on the Marshall Islands, what would that have achieved if this were a Beijing scheme? Well, if the uh, Beijing has what it wants and create an atomic region within the Marshall Islands, since Marshall Island is not a big country, and that uh, area definitely will become the uh, uh, basing operation uh, by China. And uh, very quickly, the whole Marshall Island will be under its own control influence. So that uh, this development is very, a very serious sign of the uh, China who wanted to not just about uh, take away the Taiwan and not the allies, but also to uh, sever the U.S. influence uh, with the Marshall Islands. And so that it can effectively block the whole United States um, operations uh, from Hawaii all the way to uh, First Island chain. Mm. And Marshall Islands is, is uh, situated at the very strategic important locations. Um, so that the, uh, the Chinese action is uh, very strategically in mind uh, with the aim to uh, decrease uh, or lessen the U.S. influence. Mm. And if you look at the, uh, China's other actions, such as the takeaway 
Tan Di Plom, the Allies with Kiribati and Solomon Island, and then Nauru. Uh, all of them, you link all of those uh, countries' uh, geolocation together. Mm. And you can find out it's a very, very uh, strategically minded operation by China. Mm. It is not just about Taiwan, it's, it's not about the United States. It's not just about taking States. Taiwan's allies, it's yeah. about challenging, uh, taking control of of the U.S. allies' strategic bases. And to prevent yeah. U.S. from coming to the Asia. To, uh, and coming to Asia and coming to the aid of Taiwan yeah. in a possible contingency. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Tsai, you mentioned uh, these, uh, you also mentioned these strategic bases in the Pacific Islands. Now, we, we haven't yet mentioned the Ronald Reagan testing site, uh, which is on the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this uh, Rongelap Atoll was not too far away, would not be too far away from from that base, and from that base, they the U.S. tests intercontinental ballistic missiles. It also tracks, you know, the rocket launches of, of different uh, different countries. So, you know, again, from that sort of purely military sense, what could a a state within this state, what could that do to these sorts of setups? Okay, the things that the U.S. used to have a dark history, uh, especially. Uh, in the Marshall Islands because they did some nuclear bombs test and hydrogen bomb test in the Marshall Islands. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you, do you think that these, this couple then, do you think that they were simply crooks or do you think that they were working to advance the interests of Beijing? Of course, because uh, if you try to have uh, autonomous uh, administrative uh, atolls, something like that, atoll, so it, it, isn't, it, it is not good because China can drive a wage, okay, between the Marshall Islands and the United States because they say they used to did, uh, did a terrible, do a terrible things to you guys. So you are supposed to say no to the United States. But those people, uh, those persons, they are got convicted in the United States. That means the China has been using this kind, the, uh, the Chinese has been using this kind of tools uh, to affect the Marshall Island. Island uh, so that's that's the uh, most important issue for the United States because they don't want to lose this important strategic area. Mm. Yeah. So mm. Professor Tsai, yes. let's go to what you mentioned there, which is yeah. the legacy of contention between the Marshall Islands and the U.S. From 1946 to 1958, the United States carried out dozens of nuclear test explosions over Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, including 20 hydrogen bombs. Here's one in 1956 on May 25th. We can see the plane that drops it and the ensuing mushroom cloud that forms. Now, President Lai, let me come to you. So, uh, you know, March the 1st this year marked the 70th anniversary um, of one of these US hydrogen bombs over Bikini Atoll. Um, how do you think this history does impact the Marshall Islands relationship with the U.S. today? Yeah, I think Marshall Island, due to its location, has been used by the United States as the, uh, the nuclear bomb test site. Mm -hmm. And from 1946 to 1958, not just about the two hydronic, uh, hydrogen bombs that tested, but also there are 67 and, uh, nuclear tests as well have mm -hmm. been conducted in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no wonder that the, in the Marshall Island, uh, the people there, they definitely feel uh, the kind of the, uh, the West uh, and the uh, damage uh, caused uh, by the, those nuclear tests. And why, did, why were they chosen? Why, why did I the do US not, do this? And the United States basically, in my view, uh, look at that as uh, this is the area where not a lot of people uh, and just in the middle of the uh, South Pacific Oceans and probably uh, not a lot of the, uh, 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 the protests uh, coming from that. So it will be easier site for them to conduct the uh, nuclear test. Mm. Uh, so, but this is just my guess. But mm. basically, uh, if you want to do some the nuclear test, definitely you want to look for some, uh, somewhere that uh, not a lot of people. Uh, and if uh, those people, they are uh, unaware of the development, so much the better. Uh, but basically, I think that has created a legacy. Mm. And for Marshall Island people, uh, when they talk about the United States, uh, they started to think about the, how the U.S. assistance to them is actually a compensation package uh, due to the U.S. the nuclear test they have been, uh, they've been done on their soil. Mm. That, that COFA is seen as a, as a compensation package. Do you, do you mean or is that a separate... Yeah, I think that the uh, United States definitely will see the COFA as something that's different 
but the Marshall Island, uh, many people uh, in that area thought of the, uh, this is uh, the U.S. scheme uh, as part of their compensations mm. toward the Marshall Islands, so that they think this is the United States own them, mm. rather than uh, it's a, the two-way bilateral cooperation agreement. Mm. Okay. And Professor Tai, you mentioned it before in terms of, you know, the priority for these islands um, is actually, uh, is it not security? Is it uh, more the blue Pacific strategy? It is, you know, peaceful development, climate change, mitigation and self-determination. Is And the, the Guardian writes that the, the views between the U.S. and these countries uh, differ and that the leaders are worried uh, that U.S. actions actually go counter to to their goals. How significant a problem do you think this is? Yeah, for U.S., uh, the most important thing is security, right? But for those uh, COFA countries, uh, they want uh, to rest, uh, especially save their people, especially uh, climate change is their first priority, okay? So this is very uh, important, especially, for example, like Taiwan, uh, has a program enhancing home energy efficiency and promoting renewable energy project in the Marshall Islands. So Taiwan has been uh, helping the Marshall Islands to do something, okay? So they can get a sustained uh, life over there. Otherwise, they are gonna die, or maybe they got a lot of fraud uh, in, in, the, their, in their shows. So that's the thing. So Taiwan can really help mm -hmm. the Marshall Islands without any big returns. Mm. Yeah. Okay. This year marks the 26th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Taiwan and the Marshall Islands. And the inauguration ceremony of the new president, Hilda Heine, who returned to the presidency in January, was attended by a delegation led by Vice Foreign Minister, President-elect Lai Qingde, also congratulated President Heine via video conference and invited her to visit Taiwan in May. Uh, the Marshall Islands repeatedly supports Taiwan's participation in the World Health Assembly and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. These are uh, mechanisms that Taiwan is excluded from under pressure from China. President Heine congratulated President-elect Lai Qingde in January and said that their two countries' enduring friendship is based on a shared Austronesian language background. She thanked Taiwan's government for its support in cooperative projects in the fields of education, healthcare, infrastructure, agriculture, fisheries, energy, climate, and also women's empowerment. President Lai, what would you say the relationship between Taiwan and the Marshall Islands is based on and does it differ uh, from the relationship that these Pacific Islands may have with China? I think the Marshall Island Taiwan, the relationship based on the, uh, the very intensive uh, cooperations and how Taiwan is able to play a role, uh, a role uh, for the Marshall Islands development. Uh, as the, uh, the thank you letter by, uh, congratulate letter by the uh, president of the Marshall Island to President Lai Lai Qingde at that time, uh, she mentioned uh, quite a significant uh, item of the, the many things, uh, from the uh, energy to economic development and all the way to social issue, even for the po uh, woman empowerment. Uh, I believe those are the things that the Chinese can, will not provide because mm -hmm. we know what the Chinese government is treating the woman. Overall, if you look at the Taiwan Marshall Island relationship, uh, recently there is a, a research by the Australia, the Lowy Institute, uh, regarding the uh, uh, public uh, median and uh, the, the talk, how to talk about the impression uh, when they compare the, the United States, uh, China, and Taiwan uh, in the uh, public opinion in the Marshall Islands. And both the, uh, the United States and uh, China, they score uh, uh, the, uh, the pure negative. But Taiwan is the one that scored uh, very positively. Mm -hmm. So that I think that definitely Taiwan must have done something good uh, to have a, a more favorable uh, impression among the uh, Marshall Island people. Mm, okay, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, President uh, Lai Yizong and Professor Tai Rongshang for joining Taiwan Talks today. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching the show today. Stay safe and see you next time.